I don't usually go to meat markets, but here I was with a friend who wanted to celebrate his divorce. It made me think of my own. It was a petty, bitter situation that turned into a fight pretty quickly. She cheated, got caught, and didn't want to face the consequences. When her lawyer told her that there was no way she could get the prenup revoked, she went on an epic tirade. I still have a recording of that speech on my old cell phone that I purposely saved, and I listened to it on the anniversary of my divorce to remind myself that I made the right decision. There was no celebration in my divorce. Divorce is about recognizing failure, unfulfilled promises, and I don't celebrate failure. I noted that the club was dominated by mature women, and it suddenly dawned on me that Rex was hunting cougars. Maybe he had mommy issues? Maybe he was a bit of a pervert. It didn't matter because we were together. He had just turned 40 and I was 44. Sometimes I felt like I was 90. An active lifestyle and the gym kept me in great shape, but there were mornings when I creaked and squeaked my way out of bed. My doctor once told me that I might be 44 years old, but overall I had the body of a man in his early 30s. In the mornings, my back told me that wasn't quite true. Well, it's not for me to judge that, so I tried to make the best of it. I danced a lot, and some of the women I danced with were in their 60s, but they damn near wore me out. One very beautiful woman told me she was 67 and then grinned. I prefer 69. I had no doubt she was right. And while I was trying to think of an escape strategy, Rex came running up to me, grinning like a madman and drunk off his ass. Who's the hottie? After 20 minutes, they disappeared and I didn't see him again until Monday. Deciding I'd had enough fun for the day, I headed for the door. Just then, she walked in. Her fiery red hair reached almost to her waist. This woman was exactly what I was looking for. The mercenary expression on her face confirmed my opinion. She looked around the club like a buffet, trying to find the perfect dish. Her gaze slid over me and then back to look again. I was sure I'd made the short list. The woman she was with, on the other hand, was another matter entirely. She reeked of understated elegance. The clothes, the accessories, the styling of her platinum blonde hair didn't scream money. They said she had it, and it wasn't worth talking about. She was perfect, and in the quietest way possible. You could also tell that this was not her natural habitat. She didn't seem uncomfortable, more like, unimpressed. She sipped one martini while her friend devoured three drinks, in between dancing with her partners. Several young men asked her to dance, but she turned them down with a haughty look. She intrigued me, and I approached her as a slow waltz began to play. May I ask you to this dance? She gave me an appraising look, averting her eyes. I'm 51. Congratulations. Your age doesn't prevent you from dancing? Not if the guy is in his 30s. Then perhaps we should find one here and warn him not to ask. I'm a lot closer to your age than you think, and I'm certainly well into my 30s. Have a nice evening, ma'am. I was halfway out of the hall when I felt her hand. I'm sorry. It's quite obvious that I don't want to be here, but I am. I can dance with a handsome man and make the most of it. That is, if you still want to... She was light as a feather and danced very well. I commented on that and she smiled with a tinge of sadness. My husband and I took lessons as an exercise. I liked it, but not as much as he did, especially when he started doing the horizontal mambo with one of the instructors. The girl was 25 and she had her claws in him. We divorced so he could marry her. That must have hurt. Oh, it does. At first, at any rate. But on the other hand, we had a really successful business and we didn't have a prenup, so I ended up owning half the business, plus our investments grew quite nicely. She milked him dry in three years, and I ended up buying out half of his stake in the business so he could pay her off. He's still president, because he has a good head on his shoulders when it comes to business, but it pisses him off that he has to report to me. I bet if you could do it all over again, he'd never sign up for those classes. By then, we had left the dance floor and found a quiet corner. I grinned. So, you're beautiful, rich, own a business. Why don't you have a second Mr. Angela? She grinned. There were one or two people applying for the position. Unfortunately, their qualifications were not up to my standards. How about you? It was my turn to grimace. She got a better offer from someone very similar to your ex. I don't think it's the perfect life she wanted. They say he made her sign a pretty strict prenup and is watching her like a hawk. After what she did to me, he must know that under the right circumstances, she wouldn't hesitate to do it to him. Is there a pretty girl writing Mrs. Reggie anywhere in the world? There was one two years ago. Let's just say our life goals diverged and we didn't part on the best of terms. Love sucks. 
Personally, I think love is a great thing if you have the right person. I raised my glass. Here's to love when you get it right. She raised hers. Here's to knowing when it's right. We talked for another hour. I was surprised that the time flew by so quickly. I looked back at her and grinned. I guess your friend found guys in their 30s. Her smile evaporated as she watched her friend approach. When she saw me, she hesitated, but continued to grin. Look what I found, Angie. I brought you one, but it looks like you already have a stallion. I think I'll keep them both. I'll see you tomorrow. She looked over her shoulder as they left, both boys struggling for her ass. Maybe. Angela looked disgusted. She was going through a lot when her husband left her. She got a boob job and had some wrinkles removed, hoping to win him back. He wanted nothing to do with her, and now she's going down a rather destructive path of trying to show herself as an attractive woman. All she's attracted to lately are leeches cashing in on free entertainment and her bank account. I hope she comes to her senses. It's so sad. She really is a lovely woman and quite attractive for her age. We have three other close friends in our circle. We're all going back to college, and we're taking turns trying to babysit her and keep her safe until she comes to her senses. I've just about given up hope. I have no doubt that one day she'll wake up with a bad hangover, in bed with a man 25 or 30 years younger than her, try to remember his name, and then it will hit her. I'm too old to be that stupid. And that's when she'll start coming back. You have to always remember that the first person you have to make happy is yourself. And she's obviously not happy. Her face slowly lit up. Thank you, Reggie, for that wonderful advice. I think in the near future I'll be more concerned about my own happiness than anyone else's. The phone rang and she checked it. Uber's here. Would you walk me out? I took her hand and we walked and suddenly she started giggling. What? Don't look now but those platinum-plated bitches are all over me. Why would they do that? Because they think I won the grand prize. You. You're the most handsome and trim man here. Plus, they, like me, think you can't be more than 30. They think I'm going to take you away for the night and jump into bed. I smirked. I vote for that plan. Not in this lifetime, dear. I'm afraid you could really do some damage. We stood next to Uber. I think, sweet Angie, that you're underestimating yourself. I get the feeling you're like a volcano ready to erupt at any minute and destroy everyone in front of you. I think that would be a good way to die. Good night, Angela. It was nice to meet a woman of your caliber. Then she grinned. Seismic shifts, honey. Don't get too close. I'm already too close, I said. The Uber driver looked at us and grinned. Do I have to leave? No. You need to get that treasure to her vault. Good night, Angela. Men. She was still trying to find the words when I closed the door and he drove away. Chapter 2 Three weeks passed. I remembered the blonde goddess a couple times, but then I put it aside in my mind. Rex hardly looked me in the eye until I told him that whatever happens in Cougar Cave stays in Cougar Cave. Then he relaxed and grinned. She almost killed me. The woman passed out for ten hours. I was starting to worry, but she woke up, looked at the time, and rushed to the shower. She said we didn't have time because she was late for a family function. When we were done, she showed me pictures of her grandchildren, telling me that she had four as of today. I asked if we'd see each other again, and she grinned. I doubt it. I'm too old to limit my experiences, and I don't usually repeat myself. Thanks for the night. <laughs> so the cougar chewed you up like a piece of meat, and now it's ready to go out hunting again? That's kind of cold. Rex only grinned. There's plenty of cougars in the world, buddy. You want to go hunting again? Rumor has it you went off with some really hot girl. I didn't leave with her, we just went out together. And to tell you the truth... She was a lot nicer than I expected to see in a place like this. You lost, man. You should have nailed her. Dude? Nail her? What are you, 16? Maybe you really need to spend time with older ladies. Maybe they'll help you grow up. That's never going to happen. I've tried acting like a responsible adult with my wife. We all remember how that turned out. I won't take any woman seriously anymore. It won't be two years before you're married again. I'll bet a case of beer I don't get married. If you win, I'll throw you a party. If I win, you'll have to give me the beer and tell me how I'm always right. You do have an annoying habit of being right, but not this time. This beer will be the sweetest beer I've ever had. Rex walked away laughing and I grinned. We'll see. Chapter 3 Two weeks later, I met him at tennis, and he was grinning like a cat that had eaten a canary. What the hell is going on with you? Nothing. It's just that I made some money unexpectedly this weekend, and it lifted my spirits. We fired a salvo. 
He was younger and faster, but he spent too many nights at bars while I spent them at the gym. Conditioning took precedence over talent, and I beat him in straight sets. My knee was telling me how expensive the win was when we stopped. We were drying off before heading for the shower when his smirk returned. Remember that extra money I was talking about? I earned it on you. I did what? You made a serious impression on Grandma Handsome. She showed up at the club looking for you. When she was told I knew how to find you, she grabbed me. I thought I'd get lucky, but she quickly dismissed the idea. She made me an offer. I'll give you $200 if you tell me how to contact Reggie. Better yet, give him this business card and tell him to call me. I'd like to talk to him. Hey, dude, I thought it would be funny and asked if she was knocked up. My advice. Don't piss her off. Her slap still gives me a bit of a sore jaw. Anyway, I promised her I'd give you a message and her card. Here. When I was home, I looked at the business card. It was her business card. Angela Bassett, CEO of Bassett Enterprises. And on the back was written her phone number. It was only 7.30, so I called. Hello? She looked a little wary, and I realized she didn't recognize the number. Hello? Am I speaking to Angela Bassett, who was voted the prettiest grandmother in the state two years in a row? This is Reggie Wilkes. You could hear the humor in her voice. The same Reggie Wilkes who was rumored to be Dorian Gray's successor? How old do you look now? 33? 30? I'm old enough to look damn good with you in my arms. How are you doing, Angie? I heard you put a bounty on me. Not much at all. I wondered how much it would cost to get you to my door, but on reflection, I decided to try the good old-fashioned way. What are you doing next Saturday? I don't have any pressing business. Great. My company is having an award ceremony, and I, as the big cheese, have to be there. The ex is bringing his flavor of the month gum, and I want to show him that. So you're going to use me for my body? How mercantile, Angie. Let me put it to you this way. You come with me to this event, and maybe I'll let you do something. What time should I pick you up? Her laugh sounded like verbal sunshine. I'll pick you up in a limo. I'm driving with a gun in my hand. I'm telling you right now, look for unexpected PDAs throughout the evening. Sunday, we went out to dinner. She had a really nice house. Not too big, not flashy, more like simple clean lines and elegance. After looking it over with a builder's eye, I told her how much I liked it. She frowned for a moment. You should have seen that mansion he talked me into buying. Why do two people need six bedrooms? This mansion has three, and it's about the same square footage. I gave it to him in the divorce, and he lost it in the next divorce. Now he lives in a one-bedroom condo and can barely afford it. Sucks to be him, doesn't it? First he lost quality, then quantity. Next time he'll probably be paying by the meter. She threw me a sharp look, suppressing a laugh. Don't make me yell at the dinner table. It wouldn't be nice. And thank you, Reggie. I shrugged. Sometimes you just have to tell the truth. That lobster sounds very appealing, doesn't it? We had a nice, leisurely dinner, and our conversation flowed from one place to another. We talked about places we'd already been, places we'd like to return to, and places that, if we saw them again in a thousand years, would be too soon. Soon, dinner was over, and we both seemed to not want it to end. So I took her to a little place that many people didn't realize was there. It was a place that played roots music. One week, folk singers might perform there, the next week, country or bluegrass. Sometimes there were African bands playing only percussion, and sometimes there were blues or acoustic jazz. She sat mesmerized by the night's performance by a blues duo consisting of a woman in her 30s and a man in his 50s. He played guitar and keyboards. In other songs, he played bass and harmonica. She was also a very good guitarist. They had a kick drum and a hi-hat, and sometimes you wouldn't believe there were only two people on stage unless you saw it with your own eyes. When they left for the break, the others would look at us askew. I was wearing a very nice suit, and Angie was dressed to the hilt in a copper-colored silk dress with diamonds literally dripping off of it. Most were in jeans and t-shirts. She struck up an acquaintance with the woman sitting next to her and was soon pulling out her phone, dialing the numbers she offered to sample if she liked what she heard this evening. Soon a crowd had gathered around her outside the diner. This is a family establishment, so alcohol was not served here. We made it in time for the second show, and most of the kids were already home and asleep. When we left, Angie was still on adrenaline and chattering away. I walked her to the door and she sighed. I really, really want to take you out for breakfast tomorrow, but it's too early. We'll just frame it as a promissory note and a promise that if you're a good boy, really, really good things will happen soon. Okay, good night, Reg. Good night. I'll see you on Saturday. Chapter 4 
If I thought she was outstanding on the date, the dress she wore for the event was simply stunning. She grinned at my reaction. Shut your mouth, honey. I told you I'm putting my best foot forward. Do you like the way the girls look? We pulled up to the hotel, and I guessed her business must be pretty big, judging by the number of people. There were almost 200 people there, and most of them lined up to kiss her ass. Many of them were ogling me, trying to figure out my place in the grand scheme of things. Angie was gracious and friendly in just the right combination. We mingled, 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 and after about 45 minutes, I felt her tense up. It's an X, she whispered. I looked at the medium-sized, slightly overweight man with a woman who looked barely out of her teens in his arms. It looked sad and vulgar at the same time. He walked over to us. Angie, it was said flatly, without any emotion. She, on the other hand, was smiling. Hello, Ben. Let me introduce you to my companion. This is Reggie Wilkes. Reggie, my ex-husband, Ben. He had a languid handshake, the kind that immediately makes you distrust him. But perhaps my first impression was hurt by what she'd told me about him. He hardly spoke at all, but the girl he was with chattered away. She held herself well, but her eyes gave her away. She looked at me as if she were assessing my fortune. I had accumulated a good amount of capital through my business, but I doubted I was in the same tax bracket as Angie. I wasn't stupid with money and lived well enough. That Angie was polite and looked like she was trying to suppress a laugh. We ate dinner, surprisingly good, and Angie gave her speech to great applause. Then her ex gave a speech, boring and uninspiring, promising that as long as he was at the helm, the company was in good hands. I got the impression that this was not a universally held opinion. The applause was faint at best. Then the orchestra started playing. Angie was a great dancer, and I was no stranger to dancing, so we stayed on the floor for a while longer. Then she had to do the obligatory dance with the people in the troupe. I danced with wives and girlfriends. The most common topic was the question of how serious we were. I had the standard answer. I'm just arm candy. She'll take me home tonight, deplete me to an empty husk, and then chase me away until she needs my services again. Some thought I was being serious, but most of the ladies chuckled and said she made a good choice. I was, how shall I put this mildly, dancing with my ex's girlfriend, telling her that we were going to go on a grand tour of Europe at the end of the summer, staying in my villa in France and my apartment in London, and then possibly flying off to the islands. I thought I was going to have to push her away from me. Angie noticed my distress and saved me by gently removing her hands from me. Mine, darling, mine, don't be discouraged. You have a consolation prize. Another dance, sweetheart? I told her what I said, and she burst into laughter. Her ex approached me as I was refreshing our drinks. Are you guys serious? If I get my way, this business might have a new name. He exploded. The company is mine. There will be no name change. The company was yours, and from what I've been told, you literally blew it. Surely you've already realized that a small head tends to make bad business decisions. As far as I'm concerned, you'd better be careful with Bimbo No 2, or you'll find yourself owning 12.5% of it. You son of a bitch. I'm going to... What are you going to do, Ben? Look at Reggie. That suit is unlined. You can see he's doing little more than 12-ounce curls, and he'll tear you apart. I'm more than ready to watch, so go ahead. I'll make sure no one interferes until you're done. No? Wise choice. Angie turned to me with a sly glint in her eyes. Honey, I seem to have lost one article of clothing. Have you seen... this? I clutched my underwear in my hand. I'm sorry, honey. The limo didn't go as long as we thought, and you didn't have time to put it back on, remember? She took the stuff from my hand, all the while smirking at her ex. Thanks for taking care of it, sweetie. I'd wear them again, but that would be a waste of time. You'll take them off before we're even out of the parking lot. I suddenly really wanted to stay the night. Shall we? A wave of admiration swept through the room at the repetition of the scraps of conversation, and many ladies and a few men hugged her as we left. Her husband really wasn't very well liked. Chapter 5. She was still giggling as we got into the limo. Did you see his face? I thought he was going to fall through the floor. And his little cutie was looking at him with completely different eyes. If she thought she could get away with it, she'd plow you to the floor in front of the whole crowd. Wow. Remind me never to get in your face again. The evening had been fun. Some parts were better than others, though. Which parts? The parts where I held you close to me and hugged you on the dance floor. You really are an attractive woman, and I noticed that. The giggles returned. Believe me, honey, 
When we snuggled up to each other, I noticed that you noticed it. It was very flattering. If it hadn't been dark in the car, she would have seen me blush. I'm not apologizing. I'd be offended if you did. We gradually drew closer to each other. Her hands moved south, and I heard a sigh and a giggle as she hooked the front of my pants. It was just as interesting when the car delivered us to her door. We adjusted our clothes a bit, but both of us noticed the driver's smirk. He must have gotten used to this behavior. We stood in her driveway grinning like idiots. She threw me a look I couldn't decipher. I'd like nothing better than to get you on the bed, but it's too soon. You're the first man I've taken seriously in the last hundred years, but it's too soon. We have to take this one step at a time. That being said, it's time for you to ask me out on a real date. I pretended to be angry. As far as I'm concerned, it was a real date. A real date that ended with the man in great discomfort when the woman sent him home. Don't you have any compassion? I sighed dramatically. On Monday, I sent flowers to her office along with a card. Please accept this as a token of my great love for you. Would you honor me with your company on Friday at 7 o'clock? I knew her personal assistant would read the note and share it. She brought the flowers into the study. Boitoy sent them and asked for a date on Friday. If you're not interested, can I take him? Joanne, honey, you know I love you. But you say something like that again, and I'll transfer you. My ex needs a new assistant. Copy that. If I beg on my knees, will you keep me? You're worth your weight in gold. But you say something so stupid again. Got it, boss. Where do you think he'll take you? I'll let you know on Monday. Chapter 6 We had several very pleasant phone conversations during the week. I asked her to dress more decently, jeans and a comfortable top, since the events I had planned were very casual. I found out later that she took her personal assistant shopping with her to make sure she had the perfect pair. I didn't know it, but up until that point, there were no jeans in her closet. When I picked her up, I heartily approved of her choice. She grinned when she saw me. Are you practicing sodomy? God, that's a very personal question. I think I'll wait and let you find out for yourself. In the meantime, do you prefer a smooth surface? She blushed three shades of red and laughed. I'm going to return kindness for kindness. You'll have to find out for yourself. So, where are we going? I took her to a small buffet restaurant I'd discovered. The menu for the evening was posted by the door to the kitchen, and it was served family style. There were no individual tables, just a few long ones, almost the entire length of the place. Food was served in large bowls, and if you wanted more mashed potatoes or meatloaf, you had to ask the person next to you to pass them on. It was rude not to talk, and soon you found yourself drawn into conversation with the person across the table or next to you. Once Angie got used to the idea, she talked most of the time. She shared dessert recipes with the little older lady across the table, makeup tips with the young wife next to her, talked about sports, cars, and avoided politics. She once held a baby in her arms while its mother excused herself to the restroom, glowing the whole time. She told me that she has two small grandchildren, but they live in California, and she hardly ever sees them. She was very happy, and when we pulled into the parking lot outside the concert hall, she just grinned. There was an acoustic jazz quartet performing that night. Guitar, piano, violin, and accordion. The guitarist was a woman. She and the bassist did the vocals, and the rest of the band joined in on the choruses. They played many instrumental compositions that demonstrated their skills. Some of them we recognized, but most were completely new to us. They were selling old-fashioned CDs, and Angie bought three. They played some slow songs and invited those who wished to get up and dance. We danced through three songs. This time, I made it to her couch, and we were millimeters away from putting a serious stain on it when she stopped us. I want this really, really badly. The problem is, if I get it, I'll want it all the time. Please let me set the pace. I promise that if we stay on this course, the goal will be worth the journey. It's already worth the journey, dear. I can wait, but I don't know if I can restrain myself much longer. Soon, my sweet. My sweet? I loved her giggle. She sounded so young. Yes, my sweetie. I've always wanted to say that to a man, and seriously. Two frustrating weeks later, she called me and asked if I liked boats. I guess so, I replied. I had canoes and kayaks when I was younger, and my dad had a base fishing boat when I was a kid. Will you take me boating on Saturday? I have a boat, or rather, my ex had a boat. I made sure I got it in the divorce. I did it to piss him off, and it worked. It sits in the marina, and they keep it in working order, but I never used it. In all the time he owned it, he never once took me on it. 
I want to know if it would be a pleasant enough experience that I'd want to keep her or put her up for sale. Sure. If I remember correctly, they can be a lot of fun. Give me directions. Thank you, dear. Don't worry about bringing anything with you. I'll take care of it. Is 8 o'clock too early? That would be perfect. It will still be cool and comfortable then. In the summer, the afternoon sun reflecting off the water can be very strong. We'll time the trip so we don't freeze. See you later. It was an upscale marina, and I had a feeling her boat would be a luxury model. We were heading toward an obviously restored mahogany Chris Craft boat, and I couldn't help but admire it. I was surprised that she walked past it and all the way to the end of the slips. I think I even caught a glimpse of it. It wasn't a boat. It was a van on floats, 45 feet long, almost completely enclosed, with a full-length upper deck with a canopy. Is that his boat? No, honey, it's my boat. It's fully fueled, everything is loaded, and all we have to do is set sail. Ready? And there were control panels upstairs as well as on the foredeck below. I was more comfortable upstairs because I could see better, and I kept her from talking, concentrating on getting the boat away from the dock. Once outside the marina, we accelerated a bit, and we were both surprised at the speed she could pick up. Once out into the main channel, we dropped our speed and sailed on. Angie handed me a cider, which she knew I loved. I reached for it, suddenly glad I wasn't driving the car. I would have wrecked it. I'd better. I have good plans that don't include going aground. I have a map the marina operator gave me, dear. He said landmarks would be easy to find, and besides, we have GPS in our phones and a navigation system. Another hour or so and we'll be there. There turned out to be a small cove between one of the lake's larger islands and a smaller one barely two acres square. It was a mountain lake, the first of a chain of lakes running through the whole low country, each one becoming more and more polluted. Here, however, the water was clear and almost pristine, allowing a glimpse into the depths. It was the kind of water one wanted to splash around in on a hot summer's day. Once the boat was anchored, Angie suggested a little swim. I told you I'd provide everything, she said with a sly glint in her eyes. I bought you a swimsuit. It's lying on the bed. Why don't you go and change? I hadn't realized how big the interior of this thing was. The living room gallery was pretty impressive. There was even a rather large TV mounted on the wall. The bedroom was smaller, with a huge bed barely fitting in it. The tiny scrap of fabric looked even smaller lying on it. I picked it up and grinned. It was a speedometer, light blue. I'd come back. We'd spent time together, and now we were cowering in the gallery, making a light dinner. You don't have to do that, she told me as I helped. I don't. Sometimes I won't if we expand our relationship, but sometimes I'll make you sit at the counter with a glass of wine while I wow you with my culinary skills. It's called a partnership, darling. Tears came to her eyes, and I thought I'd done something wrong. Then she grinned. I'll do my best to pretend I like it when you do. What would you like for an appetizer? This. I said, unzipping her robe and nuzzling her nipple. She tried to push me away, but stopped and moaned when I got a proper look at both of them. Finally, she pushed me away. Stop or we won't finish dinner. They'll be by your side later, I promise. We ate a simple meal and bathed, separately because the shower wasn't big enough. I put on boxers and she put on a silk robe that barely concealed her teddy. She put on a jazz CD she'd bought at Roots, made a couple drinks, and we settled on the surprisingly comfortable couch. She suddenly started laughing. He bought this thing thinking he was doing the smart thing. Now there'll be no trace of it in the form of motel receipts, and all he'll have to do is take it and meet his little bimbo at the next marina. I'll never know. And how long did that go on? Until the first time I saw her. It was in both our names, and it was quite inexpensive to have it videoed and sounded. I let him go three times to get enough footage, and then used it to get a better deal. I made sure he knew I was going to take the car and gave him a Corvette worth half as much in return. The first whore took it when she divorced him. Please excuse me for asking, but why did you marry such an idiot? You could hear the sadness in her voice. Hugh was a good man when we got together. As we became more successful, he became more arrogant, believing that his success should justify everything. Age became a factor. And honestly, I think she was the physical equivalent of a sports car during a midlife crisis. She wasn't smart, but she was very savvy and tied him up hand and foot pretty quickly, asking why he was still with a tired old woman when he could be seen around town with her in his arms. When I caught them, it played into her hands. By then, I didn't care anymore. She was delighted with him. Instead of admiring his actions and who he did them with, most people thought he was a fool, and many even pitied him. 
I think when he realized that, he suppressed his ego for a while. And then she screwed him over, and he had nothing to brag about for his poor decisions. For practical purposes, the company belonged to me, and all he had to do was accept it. It's very similar to what happened to us. I thought I was doing great, but she had taste for more refined things, and it didn't take her long to find someone once she decided to switch. It killed me for a long time before I got over it, and I became very fearful of relationships. I think I told you before, but it didn't work out the way she intended. It's one thing to please a hot young mistress. It's quite another to give her the keys to the vault after the wedding. The prenup was pretty draconian, and by then she'd already burned bridges behind her, so I had to live with it. I hear she has an allowance, and if she exceeds it, she'll be out of money for the rest of the month. I hope it ends badly in the next couple years. After all, he's already proven he doesn't mind playing relationship games with people. Maybe yours and mine will find each other after another divorce. That would be hilarious. Time for bed. Next, she pulled off her robe and twirled around a couple times before getting into bed. We had visions of great accomplishments, but she fell asleep as soon as we snuggled against each other. I grinned in the darkness, feeling her breath. Quality over quantity. This way of life suited me just fine. Chapter 7 we hopped back and forth in bed and in the water for the rest of the weekend and returned to the marina on Sunday just before dark. As we swam back, I asked her if we were exclusive. Even in the low light, I could see her eyes sparkle. I have an idea to throw you overboard. I haven't had another man in almost a year, and I'm quite happy with the one I have now. Any other silly questions? No, darling. Good. How about you? I haven't had it that long but I'll tell you that I haven't had anyone else since two weeks before I first saw you at the club. I assure you I like what we have and I don't intend to spoil anything. So, we're officially a couple then? Shall I drop a contract? I only pulled her tighter against me. No, I think verbal commitment works best in these matters, don't you? Absolutely. We stood on the dock for a few minutes before I pulled myself together. What now? Now we go our separate ways and think about this weekend and what it means to us individually. After a couple days of reflection, you'll pack up a few changes of clothes that will stay at my house. Move them over to Wednesday or Thursday and we'll see what happens. How about Monday or Tuesday? Don't procrastinate. I've got to get things sorted out. I haven't been half of a couple for a long time. I need to relax. So we did. I showed up on Thursday and she practically dragged me into the house. I left Sunday night and came back on Wednesday. It was almost two months before she invited me in for a conversation. In her mind, Conversation usually meant that she spoke, and I agreed. One day she asked me why I was doing the best I could for her. Because I enjoy giving you pleasure. I enjoy giving you pleasure. In time, if I truly believe you're making the wrong decision, or I just don't like what I hear, you'll know it. I believe you're smart enough to understand the line between low affection and weakness. She brightened. Well, I've decided I like you enough to see if I can tolerate you on a permanent basis. When can you move everything here and move in permanently? God, this is so sudden. I don't know how low... Tomorrow. Most of my stuff is already here. I'll put a few things in storage that I want to hold on to, and maybe I'll find a rental agent in a few months. It's not worth an empty house. I took her hands in mine. Now let's get down to business. You own your house and I own mine so you won't have to pay rent. I insist we split the household bills in half. I can't bear the thought of being seen as a kept woman, and you know that rumors will spread. That includes housework. I'm sure we can agree that you're better at laundry, but I'm pretty good at everything else, so I'm more than capable of that too. And if you can't stand being pampered, now's the time to say no. I know how much you love working outside. Lawn care will be canceled next week, and we'll consider it a trade-off with laundry. Everything else is 50-50. Why don't we seal it with a kiss? No, let's go to the bedroom. There were all sorts of rumors floating around in her company. Angie only grinned when an ex tried to warn her about me being a gold digger and hung pictures of us together on her desk and wall. Bimbo, no. Two made harsh hints about a ring, but he had his own issues, so he left it at that. After six months, we worked out our schedule. I was more of a morning person, so I usually got up first, made coffee, and maybe a light breakfast. Lunch was usually taken care of by her. I would cut the grass and come to her with an idea that I was willing to pay for. We ended up splitting the cost, and I built an outdoor kitchen and patio. Angie got into her sweaters and helped when she could, even when I told her she didn't have to. This is our home, and I won't be left out of any project we do to improve it. The job took almost three months, 
and we were unspeakably proud when we were done. The small covered enclosure fit a great gas grill, a charcoal grill, a four-burner gas stove built into the granite countertop, as well as a small refrigerator and a deep sink. We could have easily contracted out, but that wasn't the point. The point was that we were doing this together, and it was a labor of love. We had friends over from time to time, especially after we remodeled the outdoor area. Angie would occasionally entertain clients. I had to talk her into it. It's much more effective to invite them to your home rather than some sterile restaurant. It establishes a connection on a more personal level. This is your home. This is where you live. You're showing them a part of yourself that they don't normally see, and it usually changes their perception of you, often for the better. They will relax and be much more open to any negotiations you start. Don't let them talk business while they're here, except in the most general terms. Her business associates were impressed. It was easy to see that. They were used to dealing with her ex, and with him it was all business, and sometimes involved strong drink and strip clubs. He had offended one vendor so much that Angie had asked him to come over to apologize and insisted he bring his wife. They were supposed to book a hotel room, but she got his wife on the phone and insisted they stay the night. This became a quarterly occurrence, and he reciprocated by inviting us over every six months or so. It usually turned into shopping trips for the ladies and sporting events for us, but it was all a lot of fun. Once we took them on a boat ride, and it impressed them so much that they bought their own. Angie consistently introduced me as her life partner. At first that was gratifying, but now it was starting to get on my nerves. Chapter 8 Almost a year after I moved in, I met her son and his family. They lived on the other coast, and she rarely got to see them. When he called and asked if he could come over, she was over the moon until I made her stop. Do I have to disappear so you can have a good time? She slapped my face. You're part of my life now. They know about you and I've sent them pictures. So no, just, no. He looked a lot like his mother, but I could see traces of his father in him, especially in some of his features. Still, if he wasn't really friendly, he didn't growl at me either. His wife and children were a different matter altogether. The little boy was nine years old and the girl was seven. Heather was a California blonde. When she and the kids saw the garden, they got excited because it was as close to real food as they had ever seen. Without thinking, I promised them I would go to the farmer's market on Saturday. Angie had bought a house and three acres of undeveloped land at a time when there were no neighbors nearby. I wanted to plant a garden, but the woman in charge of the HOA saw me digging in the ground and stormed across the yard yelling at me to stop. She then proceeded to tell me how many association bylaws I had violated and was going to see to it that we were fined. The downside to this plan was that Angie and her lot were not in her development. She was already there, and the development was growing on both sides of her. I just laughed and started digging in the ground, trying to be very careful. When I had the lot ready, Angie helped me put a white picket fence around it. You couldn't see what it was from the street. She immediately got to work on the vegetable garden, advising me to grow tomatoes, lettuce, and string beans. She searched tirelessly on websites for information and ordered enough for 10 acres of land. I made her choose based on the available space, and she immediately wanted to expand the garden. The chairman of the HOA erupted into a shouting match and threatened to tear down the fence. I just chuckled and said that might not be the best idea she had ever had, and she decided to go to court. Angie took the day off to be with me. The president pulled out charts, graphs, statutes, and made some pretty convincing arguments. Then it was our turn. Angie showed the judge the deed to the property, and when she read it, she laughed and banged her gavel. Case dismissed. We thought the woman was going to faint when the judge explained to her that since our property was not part of her development, we were free to do whatever we wanted with it, within reason. The judge had to threaten her with a weekend in jail to keep her quiet. Angie had an evil glint in her eye when she asked me to make a scarecrow frame for her next month. While I was doing that, she went shopping. When the scarecrow was ready, it was dressed in the same clothes as the HOA president, right down to the big straw hat she liked to wear in the summer. Angie may have slightly exaggerated how big her ass was. It took two bales of hay to stuff those stretchy pants in it. She grinned. I read about a guy in a similar situation, and this is what he did. I couldn't think of a better way to show her nose. Every time she drove past our house to get to hers, she saw it. The other owners laughed at it, but made sure she didn't see them. She lost when her term was up, and the new guy was much more lenient with the owners. He even put it on the ballot to allow small gardens in the backyard if they were properly fenced in.
Suddenly, we got to know our neighbors much better as they sought our advice. I had gone a little overboard and purchased a huge rear tine cultivator that sat idle after I had prepared the land, so I volunteered to help. Angie would come along and sit with the wives on the patio or in the air-conditioned house while my husband and I struggled in the hot sun. Pretty soon, they had a Facebook group where they would share tips and show off the vegetables they wanted to show off. If they had more than they needed, they offered it to the group. Little went to waste. On Saturday, Heather came without her youngest. When I asked, she said he wanted to talk to his mom alone. Something wasn't right. We loaded into her rental car because it already had car seats in it. She seemed to really enjoy the market, though she hardly smiled. The kids were running around trying to look at everything. Besides the fresh vegetables, there was a group of artisans, potters, painters, jewelers. There was even a guy who for 10 bucks would compose an entire poem, especially for his customer, and print it out on his laptop. I thought it was silly, but he told me he was making two to three hundred a day. Not bad for a starving literature student. The kids ran into a face painter and practically begged me to do it for them. Heather hesitated, but I grinned and pointed at the kids. He's a lion and she's a tiger. Full face. I stepped back and was talking to one of the artisans when Heather joined me with the kids. The intricate drawings on their faces made me smile. He grinned. Does Angie know you're gallivanting around with that hottie? Heather blushed then smiled one of her rare smiles. Mom knows, but if a girl can't trust her father-in-law, who can she trust? That caught me off guard, and I had to blink a couple times. The kids wanted the crystals, and she looked embarrassed, but Bob grinned. Now you're about to find out how convenient it is to have a loaded father-in-law. If he's truthful, he'll buy his grandchildren anything they want. Damn that dust. I'd forgotten how harmful it is this time of year. Before Heather could object, Lynette picked out a pair of earrings, little fairies holding a tiny piece of crystal. Jeremiah got a necklace with a perfectly shaped crystal. It was supposed to bring luck and protection. Lynette heard Bob's words and wrapped her little arms around my lap. Thank you, Grandpa. Jeremiah thought he was too old to hug, but smirked. Thanks, Grandpa. I was now holding Lynette in my arms, and she seemed to be quite comfortable. Bob was showing Heather a ring, a crystal with gold rings around it forming a flower. I bought it for her without hesitation and didn't flinch when Bob told me how much I owed him. I can't take it. I grinned. I know you don't come around much, but it's not wise to piss off your grandfathers. It suits you very well. Bob told me it's been sitting in his closet for a year, waiting for the right finger to appear. Don't resist the magic. I was still holding Lynette, only now she was asleep. Heather held onto my hand and Jeremiah took her other hand as we walked. I was so proud that I don't think my feet hit the ground until we got back to the car. The kids were out of the car before we even got on the highway. It was a few minutes before I started talking. I'm a pretty perceptive person, something you should keep in mind for the future, and I can tell something is wrong. Why don't you tell me what's going on so Angie and I can help you? She tried to protest, but the words froze on her lips. Then she spoke. We're broke. It took every last dime we had to get here. I wondered what Junior was telling Angie as she narrated her grief. Junior had been laid off under less than pleasant circumstances and was having a hard time finding a job. They had always lived a lavish lifestyle, but the money was quickly going away. He looked a lot like his father, but I let that pass. They lost the house, her rental car, and the kids had to be taken out of private school. Coming here was killing his soul, but we had no choice. We asked his father first, but because of his personal choices, she snorted in disgust. He couldn't. Mom is our last hope. You shouldn't worry too much about Angie. She won't leave her grandchildren unattended. Nor will I, for that matter. What's he asking for? I have no idea. A short-term loan, I think. Something to help us get by until we get a job. He doesn't want me to have a job. But if I find one before he does, it'll be a strain on him. I knew Angie. She wouldn't let her child and his family starve. I also knew she wouldn't just blindly hand out money to her youngest if he was anything like his father. He would get something, but there would be some hooks in it. When I asked Heather how much cash they had, she blushed and didn't answer. I made her pull into the parking lot of the bank branch I was doing business with and pulled out a thousand in cash, handing her the envelope. Don't fuss, don't argue, just put it in your purse and use it as you see fit. And if you breathe a word about paying me back, I will be deeply, deeply offended. You will lose your status as favorite daughter-in-law very quickly, do you understand? I decided to drive to give her time to talk it out. By the time we got back to the house, she had calmed down. Angie and Junior were waiting in the living room. 
Lynette burst into the house and jumped into her lap. Grandma, I'm a tiger cub. See what Grandpa got me? Aren't they cute? I saw him tense up, but Angie only grinned as she hugged the baby. They're adorable. Grandpa never gave me anything so cute. That wasn't really true if you counted the ring I hid in the garden shed. I just hadn't had the right occasion to present it to her yet. That's because I'm the youngest and a girl. Grandpa are supposed to do things like that. That's what Jenny says anyway. Oh well, your friend Jenny seems to be very smart. Jeremiah, did you buy anything? He grinned and pulled a necklace out from under his t-shirt. Grandpa's friend said it's supposed to protect me from evil spirits. Mom bought something too. She hesitantly showed Angie the ring. She looked at me in surprise and then tears ran down her cheeks. I'll have to keep a close eye on your grandfather from now on, or you'll be swimming in bling. Linny, would you and Jer like to help me bake cupcakes? Soon, they were each holding hands and dragging her into the kitchen. The youngest stared at me for a moment. You're not their grandfather, Heather shrieked. I just looked at him calmly. No, not grandfather, not by blood. Do you think it makes any difference to them? Does it hurt a child to think there are people in the world who love them? Where's your father, Benny? Is he too busy to see his only grandchildren, his bequest of immortality? Do you realize how precious that is? Probably not, but you'd better learn. I kissed Heather on the cheek and walked out. Chapter 9 I went out to the garden shed and spent about 40 minutes sharpening tools. My father had taught me from an early age that hoes, shovels, hoes, they are all like a knife. They cut, in this case, soil. If they had a sharp edge, they did their job better. When I was done, I took up the pruning shears, and by the time I was done, I could cut hair with them. <laughs> there was a light knock and Heather asked if she could come in. I just nodded and she stood up uncertainly. Please don't hold a grudge against him. He's faced the worst failure a man can face, the inability to provide for his family. I realize that, dear, but all the more reason not to snap at the hand that's trying to help. His father made the wrong choices in life. It's not Junior's fault. It's his fault. His shiny, bright future with a woman of exceptional quality disappeared between a whore's legs one day, and he'll never get it back. He needs to make peace with his choice and try not to repeat it a second time. His son needs to make a choice, too. Angie has told me many times how much she misses you guys, especially her grandchildren. Heather, she will take care of her family. I know her well enough to do that. But I also know she won't just blindly give him money and hope for the best. She's wanted you to live here for years, and this is her chance. I bet she'll offer him a job, as sure as the ring on your finger. He's her heir, not me. I already told her I don't want any part of her company. I'm not the one to run it. Changing the subject, where are you staying? We're at the Marriott for the night. After that, I have no idea. I think I might, but I need to talk to your mother-in-law first. Come on, it's getting close to dinner time, and I'm sure Jeremiah doesn't like to skip meals. She hugged me tightly. I wish they were your grandchildren. I'd sleep so much better at night. I glanced around the kitchen, noticing the trash left behind after the little kids had tried their hand at baking, and made a decision. We'll grill tonight. I asked Heather what their favorite foods were and sent her off in my car to the market. Junior went with her. I wondered what kind of conversation they would have. Angie put the kids to bed after getting them cleaned up, and we took advantage of that to clean up the kitchen. Was it fun? Her face brightened. I regretted not having it on camera. Heather helped until she went looking for you. Junior went to his dad's for a while. Her tears flowed. I wish we could keep them. Lynette's a big fan, honey. She told me that Grandpa Reggie is going to make her the corn you picked tonight. You don't mind them calling you Grandpa? About as much as I hate it when you call me honey. God, that's disgusting. She giggled. Yeah, maybe I should call you something else. How about sweetie? Ugh, stick to sweetie. Okay, she said. Linny woke up. Grandpa, are we going to boil corn? Yes, we will. Come with me. I had already put the ears of corn in the ice water, and they were ready. I sat Linny down in a big chair at the cooking table and showed her how to pull the pokers back enough to put the oil inside and then close them tightly. I tied them tightly with fireproof ties, and they were ready to go. By then, Jer was up and helping. Their mom came in, and they rushed over to her, wanting to know if she had taken their favorite foods, hot dogs and hamburgers. She did as well as steaks, chops, and a few chicken breasts. Jer helped me thoroughly rub the chicken and wrap it in foil. Mom rubbed the steaks and chops, letting them rest and come to room temperature. Angie then took her to help with the side dishes, coleslaw, fries, and sliced zucchini, which were marinated and ready to grill. 
Cupcake stood proudly on display. Our dessert for the evening. Junior had decided to stay with his dad, and I think Heather was happy about that. I grilled enough for three large servings, knowing they would want a little of everything. Linny ate three pieces of chicken, three pieces of steak, a few fries, and an entire cob of corn, giggling as she peeled off the charred husks. Jer managed to eat a hot dog, half a chop and a steak, refusing everything else but the cob of corn. Then we each had to eat a cupcake. Linny brought me one so proud it was about to burst. The frosting was about two inches high. I baked it for you, Grandpa. She glowed with pride. Thank you, baby. He looks great. She watched anxiously as I ate every bite. And then they looked happy when Heather told them they were all staying the night and drew baths. When they changed into their pajamas, I held Linny and Angie held Jer, gently rocking him until he fell asleep. They woke up when we put them in their cribs and insisted that we take turns reading them stories. Angie had a death grip on my hand the whole time. It looked like she was about to explode with happiness. Heather was in the living room with a glass of wine. Thank you. You have no idea what it's like to get a chance to relax. I remember, Angie said. Junior was a hyperactive kid and demanded a lot of attention. Well, while you're here, you have built-in babysitters. You might get tired of having to come in and rescue them. It may take a while, and I'd like to get to that point. It all depends on your son. Angie crouched down beside her and hugged her. I know, sweetheart. I'm working on it. As we lay in bed that night, we had a rather intense conversation. Are you aware of their situation? I asked. Pretty much. I was so angry when I found out. They should have come home then. We would have taken care of them. I think your son has as much misplaced pride as your ex. What did you talk about while Heather and the kids were at my place? He has a get-rich scheme he wants me to invest in. One million. I have money, I have that kind of money, but it doesn't just lay around. And even if it did, I wouldn't let it out of my hands until I investigated. I told him to let me look into the case before I commit to it, and he got pissed. They're broke. It's their last night in this hotel. They can come here, but he hates the idea. Mind if I offer you a solution? I'm all ears. The tenants of my house moved out last week. I knew it would only take six months, but they checked out, and the only reason they needed a house was so they'd have somewhere to live while their house was being built. Let them live there for free. It will give them some alone time while they come to terms with their situation. Maybe we can find something for Heather to do while he gets his house in order. I was the third owner of the construction company and one of the field supervisors if there was an emergency. I decided there was an emergency and spent a week out of town completing an office complex. The unions were keeping us busy, and some suppliers were leaning toward their offer to make our materials a little scarce. I wasn't in the mood, so I called all of our company employees off the job and sent them off to other projects. Two days later, a real estate sign appeared in front of the house, shocking everyone. The unions threatened, but I was in my right and told the newspapers and local TV stations the truth, backing it up with facts and figures. The unions were suddenly under pressure from members who had nowhere else to go and politicians made noises about permits and investigations. Suppliers had a heart attack when I canceled nearly $2 million worth of orders. We have a contract. Indeed we do. And in that contract, it says in the fine print that if you are late with delivery more than three times in one month, we have the right to find other suppliers. Have a good day. Everyone tried to make me look like the bad guy, but there was no fooling the public. A month later, we came back with better contracts from suppliers, and the unions were much more flexible in meeting their new goals. Both my partners thought I was a genius, but I was just pissed off and needed to get even on someone. Nine days after I left, I walked out of the trailer that housed the construction office and saw Angie sitting in her Mercedes. She looked scared to death, but determined. When I approached her, she got out of the car, and I think our hearts both started pounding. When she got to me, she stood there trying to speak. Eventually, I gave up and carried her into the office. I looked at the engineers and assistants, and they all suddenly wanted coffee at the diner next door. I closed up behind them. We sat, talking, until the team got up the courage to come back. I looked at my assistant. You're on your own for the rest of the project, Mark. You've raised hopes, so consider this a test. If you do well, we can always get another project manager. And Mark, no crap from anyone, understand? They're going to test you, hard. The first time they do, Stomp on it hard and don't back down, understand? All right, I'll see you at the office. He arrived a week ahead of schedule and 20000 under budget. 
He had 10 of our employees involved, and I told him to give them each a thousand as a bonus and make sure he was the one to hand them the money. I gave him three. Angie and I slowly got back on track, but I wasn't as happy as I should have been. The fact that she was avoiding talking about marriage really bothered me. If she wanted to wait, that was fine, as long as I could see a happy ending. I thought back to my first marriage, before it ended badly, and realized that I liked being married, having a bond and a document to prove to the world that we were one. Now her son was around, and she was very tense. Chapter 10 Two weeks later, she gave her son the bad news. She checked to see how favorable his offer was, and it turned out to be nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. Angie insisted that he work for her in the short term, just to make some money. He resisted at first, but then Heather lost her patience and got herself a job. She went to work for a construction company as an office assistant. The pay was above average, and not because it is what it is. It was because my partners and I had decided from the beginning to hire the best and pay them accordingly. Sarah was in charge of all office functions, and one of the first things she did was organize free daycare for our employees. You guys, and you have no idea how stressful the cost of childcare can be, especially for a single mom. We're going to do this, and we're going to have employees for life. She was a single mom herself, and her part of the startup was covered by an inheritance from her grandmother. David and I had already talked about it being time to go into business for ourselves, but it was just talk. She was the office manager at our old firm and basically got us off our asses and into business. We were so grateful to her that we named the company SDR Construction in honor of Sarah, David, and Reggie. David was an engineer and I was in construction. We had a very good personal reputation and some of our corporate clients were unhappy with management, so they gave us a chance. Ten years later, we were a multi-million dollar construction company known for excellent quality at a reasonable price. Our old company got so angry when we left and selected a few people to go with us that they threatened a lawsuit. Our lawyer told us that they could try something like that while he handled all the paperwork and for us to tell them to kiss our collective asses. We let Sarah tell them about it because she had been through a lot of crap in office politics over the years at the company. She said it was one of the best times of her life. If I arrived before Heather did, she had to bring the kids before they went to daycare. I would get hugs and kisses and I loved starting the day that way. Heather always kissed me on the cheek. A month later, I came into work and noticed everyone was grinning at me. On my desk was a huge mug with pictures of Linny and Jeremiah on the side. On the other side was written, Best Grandpa Ever. The one that caught my eye the most was the smaller one next to it, with a picture of Heather and the caption, Best Father-in-Law Ever. I put them on the shelf so they would be the first thing I saw every morning, next to Angie and I's picture. Heather was called into Sarah's office and told that her position had changed. She would now be running errands for the company. She had to have good transportation, and she had to pick the right SUV to fit everything in. After she was done crying, she made me go with her to the Ford dealership where she picked out the same model I drove, a four-door sporty model with a small cargo bed. Angie only smirked as she told me about it. The closer I got to Heather and the kids, the more aloof her husband became. One day, Ben Sr. came to me apparently to threaten me. Stay away from my grandchildren. They are not yours. I think I made him nervous as I grinned. Have you told them that yet? Oh yeah, you're going to have to spend time with them for that, aren't you? How much time have you spent with them since they've been here? Have you taken them anywhere or just sat at home and watched them play? According to them, no, and whether I stay on stage or not, you need to change that. If you want them in your life, the best way to accomplish that is to include them in your life. The aggression went out of him like air out of a balloon. Casey doesn't care much for them. Then you have a choice to make. Bimbo Barbie or your grandchildren. It shouldn't be hard, but I don't know your priorities. To be clear, I won't interfere in their lives if Angie or the kid's parents say so, but I don't think that's possible. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to put together a playset. Would you like to help? I must have made an impression because he followed me into the house. Angie and Heather could have been knocked over with a feather when he came out of the house and the kids pounced on both of us. It was a pretty elaborate setup, but I owned a construction company and once Benny figured out what was involved, he was already pretty good. An hour later, he was already pushing Jeremiah and I was pushing Lenny. The ladies took their seats and we drank beer while watching. There were tears in his eyes. I've made so many stupid decisions in my life. From what I'm hearing, I have to agree with you. We don't know each other that well, but today has presented you in a different light. 
Foolish choices are what we end up learning from. So why don't you come to our weekly Sunday event? Heather took lots of pictures, and they appeared on her Facebook page later that evening. They showed Benny and I bolting and the kids eagerly waiting. In the last photo, we were each pushing a child, and the caption read, Grandpa's rule. After everyone left, Angie gushed over me. You're going to get a really good dose of love today. How did you do it? I didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Honey, you already know that if something needs to be said, I don't hesitate. He deserves to be in their lives if he can. I know my heart would break if I lost them. Damn it, she cried, and nearly ruined the mood. Thankfully, by evening, she came to her senses. Chapter 11 A truce of sorts existed between Benny and me. He came over about every other Sunday to grill. Sometimes he helped, but mostly he played with the kids. Bubblegum Barbie noticed he was slipping away and gave him an ultimatum, but he didn't really respond. She moved out of the townhouse within two weeks. She took all her clothes and jewelry, but had a breakdown when he told her she couldn't take the sports car he'd rented for her. When she stopped talking, he said she could have the car and the 27 remaining lease payments. Heather was happy and enjoyed her job. They treated her like any other employee, even though their father-in-law was one of the owners. It only happened a few times at first, and she put up with it. After that, everyone would take it out on her like the other workers, and she would just smile and wave them off. I looked at my life and realized that there were only two things that would make it perfect. The first is the day Angie and I walk down the aisle, and the second is when Junior finally settles down and accepts his life. For some reason, he's decided that all his troubles are directly related to me. Angie and I had a few tense discussions about how he was trying to treat me, and when Heather tried to talk to him about it, things went south. It turned into a full-blown, hold-nothing-back discourse that resulted in him realizing that if he didn't like his life here, he had two options. Make it better on his own or leave, but she and the kids would stay. F he spent a few nights on his father's couch until he got sick of it and kicked him out, telling him to man up and go back to his family. He came home, but he was moody and often snapped at his kids. Heather was almost at her wit's end when suddenly the situation worsened. Angie fired him. It nearly killed her, and she spent many nights snuggled up to me and crying herself to sleep. <laughs> she had started to trust him, and he was getting much better at his assigned position, but he still harbored resentment and wanted to go back to California. Heather didn't really approve of the idea. Why would we do that? I've already had to tear this family apart once and start over. I don't want to do it again. She sighed. You need to think about it. You're making more money now than you did in your best year in California, and unless you've turned into a screaming idiot, you certainly realize that both your parents are hoping you'll take over the business in a few years. I have a job that I really love. We have no house payment, no car payment. Basically, all we have are living expenses, and we live pretty well. But the most important thing is the kids. They love it here. They adore your mom and think both grandpas could change the world if they wanted to. Think how they'd feel if we picked up and left. They only have one grandfather. The other guy is just a loser mom is cohabitating with. Heather slapped him. Hard. Don't ever say that in front of me again, not in this life. In case you haven't noticed, we live rent-free in the loser's house. I drive the car he gave me, and if I picked up the phone and said, I need to, whatever it is would be here in a heartbeat. Lynette told me the other day that when she grows up, she's going to build houses like her grandfather. I think Jeremiah is going to be the next business tycoon. He loves going to the office with Grandpa Benny. We have a very bright future, honey. He pondered this for a few days, and then used his job to tap into the company's funds and borrow 200000 to invest in the business he had wanted to do all along. The plan was to invest the money, make a windfall, jump back out, replace the money, and make a profit until he had enough money to return to California in peace. The plan failed when the profits were gone and the scheme went bust, leaving many investors holding the bag. The accountants cracked it after three weeks. Angie fainted when she found out, and her assistant called me and Ben. They called an ambulance and took her to the hospital for observation. We met at the emergency room, and the doctor told us she was in severe shock and they wanted to keep her overnight. Ben and I walked around the floor for four hours, and he only came home when his new girlfriend came to pick him up. She was still younger than the model, but only by eight years. She didn't let him do much, kept him in line, and her grandchildren adored her. He wouldn't admit it yet, but he was so in love with her, he couldn't keep his eyes open. One day he told me, while we were fiddling with the grill, and Angie and Vicky were watching the kids in our new pool, that he was tired of condo life and was looking for a house. Vicky was actively helping him, just to get a woman's opinion, he explained. 
What he really meant to say was that he would buy the house she chose. I had a stray thought that he was actually getting married before I did, and it made me uncomfortable. I didn't leave the hospital, sleeping in the chair by her bed. She woke up around three, and I spent another two hours holding her in my arms until she cried before the day shift came in and gave her another sedative. In the afternoon, she was discharged, and Heather was there to drive her home. As she was being wheeled out, Heather noted how frail she looked and burst into tears. I ended up driving, and they sat in the back seat hugging each other. Evan! We got her settled in the house, and Heather told me what was going on in her world. He's gone, Daddy. I came home, and the bedroom is trashed. He packed up as many clothes as he could and disappeared. I don't know if he's coming back. Six months later, she started calling Angie mom. Her parents had retired to Portugal, and if she was lucky, she saw them once every four years, so we became her mom and dad, the ones she could go to with any problem. She grinned the first time she called me dad. I call Angie mom, and you're the best dad I've ever had, so if you don't mind, I'll be dad. I had no objections. Chapter 12 Heather checked the bank accounts and it appeared that he had emptied them. There was a good amount in savings. She once told me that sooner or later I would probably kick them out of the house and they needed a backup plan. Angie explained to me that they were actually saving for a down payment on the house I would build for them on one of the acres of her land. No. Heather was beyond angry and spent most of the week with us. The kids loved it, but in the end, they wanted to come home. Two weeks later, Angie was angry enough to activate the GPS unit on his car, which belonged to her company. From what the app showed, he was in a small town in Texas. Ben and I flew after him. We found him in a small bar with a hole in the wall where he was telling the bartenders what a great businessman he was. As long as he was buying, they were in agreement. Ben patted him on the shoulder. Son, it's time to come home. He twisted around on the bar stool. His eyes widened. Then he saw me. Come to gloat, asshole. You took my family away from me, you bastard. I nearly threw up every time Heather spoke. Reggie did that, or you should see what Reggie gave the kids. Then he turned to his father. And you? You just stood by and let him take it all away. What kind of man are you? Benny looked at him for a long moment. Do you know what Reggie took from me? Not a damn thing. Everything I had, I threw away long before I ever heard his name. It took me a while to pull my head out of my ass. But I did it. I'm closer to your mother now than when we got married. She's my friend now, and for a long time I didn't have any friends. But you know what? This isn't about Reggie or your mom or even me. It's about you and what you've done. Now get your ass up off that stool and come home to face the music. I wasn't expecting that or I would have reacted. He jumped off the bar stool and punched my dad right in the face. The man fell over and went out like a light. He stood and smirked, swaying slightly. Want some, old man? I smirked. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I'd like to say it was an epic fight, and we fought all over the bar until we went outside to continue, but it didn't happen. Junior didn't know anything about wrestling, but I did. My father had been an amateur champion when he boxed in the Golden Gloves as a teenager and had been a member of an elite boxing team when he was in the Navy. The military taught him a whole new way of looking at fighting, and he passed it on to me. I didn't box, but I did wrestle in college, and he made sure to train me just in case. That helped me a lot in the beginning of my construction career. Sometimes you just can't change a person's mind. Sometimes you just have to be proven right. In Junior's case, I felt like I needed to be proven right. He swung a clumsy right cross and I grabbed his arm as he passed, jerked and threw my hip out. That sent him flying across the floor. He got up and lunged again to attack. Again, I dodged him, using his momentum to smash my face into the counter. I could have done this all day, but the deputy tapped me on the shoulder. You can stop now, we'll take it from here. The bartender called out as he knocked his father out. Another deputy dragged the younger man across the bar to cuff him while the medics examined Benny. He got hit pretty good and was sent to a local hospital to be evaluated for a concussion. We didn't have to press charges. The bartender and the cops were happy to do that for us. Disturbing the peace, damage to personal property. Technically, that was on me. When I threw him across the room, he landed on a chair and it collapsed under him. Two counts of assault and one count of assault on a law enforcement officer when he kicked the aide who was handcuffing him. She put her baton between his legs and knocked. He immediately became much more cooperative. His bail was set at $25,000, and neither Benny nor I was inclined to post it. He spent three weeks in jail before his first hearing was held. On the advice of a public defender, he pleaded guilty to lesser charges. 
was found guilty, sentenced to a year, and released with time served in probation. He also had to make restitution to the bartender for the chair and pay a $5,000 fine. Angie flew in and paid it, but on the condition that the state let him serve his probation at home. This essentially trapped him, which did nothing to improve his mood. Three weeks after he returned home, Heather asked him to leave. You're no longer the man I married. Why aren't you happy? You had everything and you were too stupid to appreciate it. They were home and the children were with us. He stepped back to hit her and she laughed in his face. Go ahead, but as soon as you stop swinging, you'd better run. Daddy will come after you if he has to look for you at the ends of the earth. And I'd like to be there when he finds you. He left three hours later, but came back two days later because Angie called and said that if his ass wasn't back by the time he had to check in with his parole officer, he'd be on his own. Benny had found a house by then and let him stay in his apartment until the deal went through. Heather wasn't kidding, and when she handed him the divorce papers and filed for temporary alimony, he was furious. Angie let him know that he could no longer work for the company, and he was out of a job. If he didn't find a job soon, he would be in violation of his probation. I pondered this whole situation while Heather cried on my shoulder and Angie stroked her from the other side. Angie had been depressed for almost two months. Heather's nerves were shot, and even the kids were starting to feel the strain. It was making them lock in on us even more. After we put Heather to bed, I told Angie that I needed to go out. Go out? Now? It's a little late. It won't take long. Just better not have all the blankets on by the time I get back. Angie was an avid blanket lover. Many times I woke up uncovered and she was wrapped up like a cocoon. I tried this several times and decided to keep a spare blanket by the bed. She always apologized in the morning, but it was hard for her to contain her smile. Should I get a heating pad? I'll be gone a long time and I'll cuddle you until you start purring like a kitten when I get back. She just kissed me and fell asleep before I could start the car. I drove right up to Benny's apartment and knocked on the door. Junior opened it, saw me, and tried to slam it shut. I swung the door open with such force that he fell to the floor. I closed the door and sat on the chair while he tried to get up. If you want to swing, swing. There's no one here to save you, and I'm going to stomp your ass into mush and enjoy the hell out of it. I'll call the police. Try that. I'll be on you before you can press nine. We're going to have a little talk about your future. Let's reminisce a little first. You went broke in California and came home. Your mom was over the moon. She was already planning her retirement in a few years and gave you a pretty responsible position. We gave you a place to live, cars for you to drive, and watch the kids as often as you would let us. One would have thought you had died and gone to heaven. Heather says it was the happiest time in her marriage. You literally fell into the flames and discovered you were fireproof. Was that enough for you? Hell no, it wasn't. So you stole from your parents and got into some arcane scheme to prove you were smarter than the rest of us, when in fact you were the dumbest son of a bitch on the East Coast. You abandoned a successful company that was worth more than you could have accumulated in a lifetime. You seem to have given up a woman worth three times as much as everyone else and two wonderful children. Is that it? So, now that you've said that, what do you want, Junior? What would it take to make you happy? The suffering of everyone around you? If that's your goal, you're doing pretty good. It's a one-time offer, refuse, and I'm gone. Just so you know, a woman like Heather won't be single for long, even with two kids. Some good man will realize what a prize she is and make her love him for life. Maybe you want to go to prison. That would be a real eye-opener for you. I'll give you a hint, kid. You're a wimp. I was on edge, letting go of what I'd been holding in because of my love for his family, but now it was time to take the gloves off. While he sat on the couch and cringed, I was already pacing. Finally, I stopped in front of him. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to be manly or prove that you're really a bitch? Well, holy shit, he started crying. I thought it was funny and sat down while he cried. I don't have a job, and no one in this neighborhood will touch me with a 10-foot pole either. I can't leave the state or I'll violate my probation. If I don't get a job soon, I'll violate. If I even get a traffic ticket, I'll violate. I'll never get my family back. My parents despise me, and you must be enjoying the hell out of this. I slapped him. Really hard. Finished with the pity party? I'm going to do something for you, even if it's to my teeth. Rest assured, I'm not doing this for you, but for the family I love. I tossed one of my business cards. Be at this address on Monday at 8. If you're not there, I wash my hands of you. Don't wear a suit. You won't need it for a long time, if ever. 
wear sturdy jeans, good boots, and a work shirt. You just got into the construction business. You will work without complaining, whining, or crying. You will be courageous and do what you are told. I'll know if you don't. I walked to the door. By the way, 25% of your paycheck will be deducted weekly and sent to Heather. You still have children to support. And if you have any hope of getting your family back together, this is a good place to start. As I drove home, I pondered whether anything I'd said mattered. We'll see on Monday. I grinned when I saw Angie wrapped up like a mummy. I once told her that she must have been a lizard in a past life, because I'd never met anyone so cold-blooded. She only grinned. Lizards like to lie on rocks, I realize that, and I like to lie in the arms of a man who will keep me warm. Chapter 13 No one was more surprised than I was to see him in the office on Monday. I assigned him to the on-site crew and told his supervisor and supervisors not to patronize him, but to treat him calmly. Give him a chance. A lot depends on him in this job. Set. I later learned that the first day he went home and cried because his body hurt so much. The next day he could barely work, but he still came. After a month, his body adapted, and he had real muscles for the first time in his life. He was tried at all kinds of jobs and seemed to have a real aptitude for hinging and finishing sheet iron. Sometimes I would see him from my office as he got out of the work truck looking like a ghost because of the dust that covered the sheetrock. Heather moved to the payroll department, so she saw his name and the first check. Then the money from the help desk came into her account. She stormed into my office. Did you do this, Daddy? Someone had to give him a job, and I didn't want you to have to take the kids to the county jail. I paid him a visit and asked him nicely. For sure. More like you beat the crap out of him and made him show up. I did nothing of the sort. If you didn't, it's because he was more afraid of you than I thought. Do you think he'll last long? Time will tell, little one. Now go and get the kids from daycare. <laughs> from time to time, they passed each other in the hallways and barely spoke. Once, he begged her to let him eat lunch with the kids on the picnic tables outside the daycare center. She almost didn't allow it, giving him a rather stern lecture on how to behave. But just in case, she decided to eat with them. All was going well until Linny climbed into his lap and showed him the little helmet I had given her. Look, Daddy, I have a helmet too. We're both going to be construction workers, just like Grandpa. Fat tears streamed down his cheeks as he hugged her. Then Jeremiah turned and in a strangled voice thanked Heather for being so good to him. Tears ran down her cheeks as well. If he worked in this town, he tried to stop by her place for lunch as often as possible. He always asked Heather to have lunch with them if she had time. She made time. He left his father's townhouse and rented a small studio apartment near the office. I let him drive one of the company trucks to haul supplies, and he tried to drive it only when necessary. It was a four-door model, so he could take the kids whenever Heather let him. Six months passed, and Heather walked into my office and closed the door. Daddy, can I talk to you for a minute? Sure, honey, what's on your mind? Benny. I knew she meant her Benny, so I nodded. We've been talking a lot lately. He comes over to our house at least twice a week to have dinner with us. He's changing. I can see it happening. I need to ask him for a favor. He really wants to talk to his parents. Can I bring him over on Sunday? His parents had written him off. Angie didn't know I had given him a job, and I tried not to bring it up in conversation. I warned Heather, and she only mentioned in passing that he'd found a new job and was paying child support. Let me talk to your mother first. I won't ambush you. I'll see which way the winds are blowing and get back to you. Chapter 14 Angie and Ben weren't thrilled with the idea, but agreed to give it a try for Heather and the kids' sake. He came in looking scared to death. The kids were all around him, showing him the new pool with the water slide and chattering nonstop. We left them alone, and after we ate, he asked the parents if he could talk to them. I gathered up the kids and Heather, and we went out for ice cream, returning 45 minutes later. He was already gone. Angie had tears in her eyes, and Ben looked a little worried. He apologized, and I think he meant it. He swore he'd pay us back, but we told him that if he really felt that way, he should give it to the little ones. We made it clear to him that we would never let him work for us again. At least not until enough years had passed for us to consider him reliable. He said he didn't expect that kind of forgiveness and would never let us down again. I hope he's sincere. Angie surprised me by becoming more determined. I listened to him and then told him that words come easy. Does he want our forgiveness, our respect? Then he needs to start earning it both with us and with his family. Benny has a lot of setbacks to overcome, and I hope he picks himself up and does it. Later, as we lay in bed cuddled together, she surprised me with a few more tidbits. He had nothing but good things to say about you. 
You really made an impression on him and are probably a role model for him now. And then to my surprise, he gave me some advice. He said I should put your ring on my finger and stop procrastinating. If I'm so afraid of a permanent commitment, maybe I should let you go so you can find someone else. I'm starting to like that boy. She jabbed a finger at me. Shut up, this is serious. Yes, it is serious. And while we're on the subject, are you ever going to marry me? She froze and I sighed, turning my back to her. After a few seconds, she pressed herself against me. Honey, I was so afraid. You can't prove it now, but when Ben was Junior's age, he was a lot like him. I spent years putting up with things I shouldn't have put up with. I still sometimes have nightmares about the person I was back then. I swore that it would never happen again, that I would never let a man have that kind of power over me again. I would have stood up, but she clung to me tightly. I'll leave tomorrow. The slap I hadn't expected, but it was a no-nonsense one. A light flashed on and my jaw ached. You're not leaving. I'm trying to tell you that I've changed. You have more power over me now than anyone has in my entire life. Your smile, your touch, the way you light up when you do something special for me and see that I like it. The way you almost glow when Heather brings the kids, I've come to live for that. And then, in the clumsiest way possible, I tell you that if you asked a certain question, you might like the answer this time. I saw her mentally catch her breath and shrugged. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you tomorrow, Monday at the latest. I told him about the previous night as we fished from a platform specifically designed for that purpose. And after he caught a base on the reel, he grinned and held out his hand. Congratulations! You've won a damn attractive woman! However, if you ever treat her the way I did, well, I can't kick your ass, but I'm a damn good shot. Keep your gun in the safe. I think I can handle it. He called from the boat to wish her well. He hung up laughing. I'll be your best man. Heather and Vicky will be your bridesmaids. And Jeer and Linny, though they're a little old for it, will be the ring bearer and flower girl. Do you think you'll be able to avoid moving before the wedding? I'll grit my teeth and live with it. Chapter 15 Sixteen years later, Angie, Ben, Vicky, and I watched with pride as Lynette earned her master's degree in construction management and engineering, a double major obtained at the same time. Her management thesis was titled Building the Box. She used part of her thesis in her acceptance speech. She talked about her progress from the time she built her own storage box, complete with hinges and a handle, at the age of nine. She still keeps it to this day. She went on to tell how she built a birdhouse, then a doghouse, then a playhouse, then a playhouse, several small sheds, and then followed up with the construction of a vacation bungalow that she designed in her spare time. It was built for the family. My grandpa Wilkes taught me about building, walking me through the process from the casket to the bungalow. He taught me that anything that is built is essentially a box. They just get bigger and more complicated, so you have to build the best box you can. Then my grandfather, Ben Bassett Sr., taught me how to build business relationships to always act with integrity and keep your word. And if you do that, you will always be successful whether you make money or not. I've found that the same is true in relationships of any kind. You build a strong box and address any weaknesses and flaws you discover. My grandparents and mom always made sure my box was strong. When I get married and start my life with someone else, you can be sure that a box will be built around our love and there will be no weaknesses in it. It was very touching. So why didn't she thank her father in the speech? He moved in with her a few months after he came to the party, and it was another month before they slept together. I made him the host because he deserved it, and by the time a year had passed, I thought they were over their problems. Then one day, he just disappeared. No warning, just showed up late for work, packed his stuff in his truck and left. True to his word, he left a short note saying he was going back to California, that he was sorry and that he would send support for the kids. Heather was devastated again. We had to send her and the kids to therapy to deal with being abandoned. Ben and I tried to fill the void and that helped a little. Of course, we put detectives on his trail and they found him two months later. He was working for a construction company as a subcontractor on a large apartment contract and was living with one of his old girlfriends. She seemed to be the reason he wanted to move back to the West Coast. She left and got married when he came home. Their relationship didn't last a year. They kept in touch via email corresponding on an account Heather didn't know about, and when she told him she was single again and really missed him, he disappeared the next day. Heather grieved for him for a while, and then moved on with her life. She didn't have the option of riding off into the sunset, leaving her children behind. She filed for divorce three months after he left, and she filed it at her place of employment.
There was a child support clause in the papers, but she gave him a way out. Sign away his parental rights, and he was free to go. His new woman was not thrilled that he would have to give up such a share of his income and pressured him until he signed the document. Two years later, Heather became the assistant supervisor of payroll and human resources and had to deal with every employee in one capacity or another. I sent her off to school to get her degree, allowing her to work half days so she could attend classes. She came back full time with a vengeance, stormed into my office and jumped into my lap. Why are you being so nice to me? I never told you, but my first wife was a selfish beep and lied to me about being able to have children. She fought me to adopt, and after we broke up, it turned out she had her tubes tied to avoid pregnancy. I was destined to be a biological dead end, to die unloved and unattached, and then I met Angie. I knew we would never have children, but her love was worth it. And then you came along and gave me a chance to rethink everything. You and the kids have been in my heart since that first weekend, and my feelings have gotten stronger and stronger. Heather, you are the closest daughter to me, which is why I decided to adopt you, not in a legal sense, you're too old for that, but in an emotional sense. And since you're my child, that automatically makes you my heir. That's why I pushed you to get your degree. When I retire, my part of the business will go to you. I've talked to Sarah and David, and they think it's a good idea to keep the business in the family. The paperwork is ready, and all you have to do is get on your feet when I'm gone. She got so agitated that I had to call Angie over to calm her down. She stroked her until she stopped snorting and smiled. You really didn't see this coming, did you? You've been his pride and joy since you arrived. Honor his love and work hard. You have about 10 to 12 years to prepare yourself. David's son then went in to do the insurance paperwork and met Heather. Sparks flew, and 15 months later, I had the honor of marrying her. Talk about keeping the family together. Sarah was David's sister, and her son was a career military man, so Heather and DJ David Jr. were to have it all. They were in their 30s by then, and no one was surprised when they had a son, whom they named David Reginald. Heather had to warn us. Moy, you have the older two most of the time already. Give me that one. It was really, really hard, but we held it together. Jeremiah took Benny's example, working summers and school vacations for the company while both grandparents mentored him. Lynette did the same at my firm. She even worked on construction crews for two summers before heading to the office to learn from her mother and Sarah. Jeremiah earned his business degree, and after two years it was clear that he would be running the family business in a few years. His grandparents couldn't wait. By the time Lynette got her degree, Angie was 70 and I was 64. Angie had retired three years earlier, and this was my last year before Heather took office. We planned to stay active, travel, and look out for the next generation. Jeremiah had already married, had a young son, and had a second on the way. Linny wasn't ready to settle down yet, but we knew it wouldn't be long before she was taken by someone who didn't deserve her. Fourteen years after he left, we received notice that Benny Jr. had passed away in a construction accident. He was attempting to unload a full sack of 14 by 4 and a half, 32 sheet tongue and groove board using an electric winch. Safety regulations required that two winches be used at the same time and that an observer be present, but he was in a hurry. He had lifted the winch nine feet in the air when the weight shifted and it collapsed on him. According to the accident report, he was crushed on impact. We didn't get the notice until three weeks after the funeral, when the state was going through the paperwork looking for next of kin. It turned out that his new wife had run away three years ago and left him with two daughters to care for. The mother couldn't be found, and California wanted to know what to do with them. Ben, Vicky, Angie, and I immediately flew out to the site. The children were girls, one eleven, the other nine, and they were the rudest and most disrespectful kids I had ever encountered. The older one snapped at us. If you're our grandparents, how come we've never seen you, huh? Uh, because until a few days ago, we didn't even know you existed. If we had, you'd know a lot more about us now. I'm not going anywhere with either of you. Angie and Vicky were tearing up, so I pulled myself together. If they can't find your mother, you may have no choice. If it comes down to rich grandparents taking you out of the hands of the state, putting you in foster care, and paying for your upbringing, the state will take care of itself. I suggest that if you don't have anything important keeping you here, if they can't find your mother, come back with us and check out the situation. Think about it. The older one looked defiant, but the little one just looked scared, so I turned to her. How about it, princess? New clothes, a big house, an older brother and sister to help look after you if you need it, and rumor has it, I might make a damn good grandparent. I have references if you're interested. 
Benny echoed me, saying that we sometimes competed to see who could spoil the grandchildren the most, and then backed off and let the ladies take care of them. Angie finally got her way when she started showing them pictures of their older siblings, noting how similar they looked, and that we had plenty of room in both houses, showing them pictures of the outdoor kitchen and pool, as well as a few of our boats. Benny and Vicky had bought themselves a streamlined boat as a retirement present, but we still used the big boat, the third boat, when everyone wanted to go for a ride. The house Vicky chose was outside of town and had several acres of land. They had a number of animals, including three horses. We never felt the urge to go horseback riding, but Jer and Linny loved to do it, so they were there as often as they were at our house. Although we tried to spoil them, we also tempered our excesses with life lessons, and they were pretty balanced teenagers. This hit a nerve with the youngest, Vanessa. I've never sat on a horse. Vicky grinned. She, like me, had never had children, and this was a golden opportunity for her. Come home with us, little one. I'll teach you to ride in no time. Charlene was obsessed with boats. I've never been fishing. Well, if you come with us, you'll spend so much time on the water you'll feel like a duck. And we stayed with them for two weeks while they finished their search for their mother. We took advantage of this by getting permission to take them to different places. An amusement park, a Chuvash ranch where we took them horseback riding for the first time. But mostly we just spent time with them, reassuring them that we weren't cannibals who fried babies for breakfast. Vanessa bonded with Benny and Vicky, and Charlie seemed to like us better. Eventually, they went home with us, and since Vanessa insisted on it, they lived with Benny and Vicky. Charlie went with them as well. We were a little disappointed, but realized they would need breaks, and we usually took them on weekends. The first year was hard as we had to wean them off some bad habits, but by the second year, they had relaxed enough to feel safe and loved, settled down and blended into the family. Heather and her husband had custody of them, and Jir wanted them to spend time with him and his wife, a woman he met through work. They dated for a year until he brought her to a party, scared to death that she was Indian. No one bothered to find out where that came from and welcomed her with open arms. She cemented her place in the family when she started bringing dishes for sit-down meals. One day, she brought a huge pan of curry and we emptied it, ignoring the steaks and chicken. He told his younger sisters that they would use them as training tools when they had their own. They were so enamored with Mary her Americanized name, that they insisted on wearing a sari to one of her friend's weddings. These photos have a place of honor on our wall. I think they preserved our youth. Angie came to Vanessa's high school graduation, but it was her last public appearance. She was two months short of her 80th birthday when she fell and broke her hip and died two weeks later from complications. It happened suddenly and left me in despair. But after mourning her for six months, I realized we had not had a bad life. From the day we met, we had no one else. No dating, no flings, no other relationships. We just connected and wouldn't let each other go. Even for a second time, it was unusual. Every night I looked at the plaque I gave her a couple years after we were married. It was an award that proudly read, Most Beautiful Girl, with the name of our state and the date in a small inset at the bottom. Each year I took it back to the store where it was purchased, and they added another insert for the current year. When Lynette had her first child, I bought a new plague labeled Most Beautiful Girl of the Year and started adding inserts. She giggled every time I added a year and blushed profusely when Vanessa once asked her what a gilf was. I said it stood for Grandma I Will Love Forever, which made her glow even brighter. I discussed it with Angie, and we decided that if Vanessa didn't already have a house, she would buy ours. Benny and Vicky agreed that Charlie would get his. The next year, Benny passed away in his sleep. I hugged Vicky and made all the necessary arrangements. I got in the habit of leaving her at my house a couple times a week to make sure she was okay, and a year later she moved in with us. We never had a relationship, although we loved each other as friends. We were just two elderly people who didn't want to be alone. The kids all grinned, and Angie and Benny must have laughed their asses off. Sometimes we'd sit on the veranda in our rocking chairs, admiring the sunset, talking about departed loved ones and agreeing that no matter how we started out, our golden years were as brilliant as could be, and we were damn lucky in who we chose to love. One night, we talked about everything until well into the night, and when I got up to go into the house, she said she wanted to sit out for a while to enjoy the cooler weather. I left her for about 45 minutes, marveling at the tears in her eyes, and then decided to get a blanket for her if she was going to stay, or help her inside if she was ready. She didn't seem to need the blanket anymore. She walked past, still warm and with a smile on her face. 
I bet right now, she and Benny were hugging like crazy, and Angie was smiling. So I sat down next to her and waited for the ambulance, talking to her. Vicky, it may have come a little late, but you got what you dreamed of. A good man to love, children to raise, surrounded by a large family that loves you just the way you are. Not many people leaving this life can say that. If you can hear me, I want you to take a message to Angie. Tell her I'll be there soon with a new sign. It will say, hottest girl in forever, and it will be the absolute truth. The EMTs appeared and I kissed her on the cheek, wishing her a happy journey before they carefully moved her onto the gurney. Sighing, I started making the rounds of calls, knowing the house would soon be full. I thought of the girls who, in less than a year, had stopped calling her grandma and started calling her mom. She told us it was the second most important moment in her life, right after marrying Benny. They will be devastated, and we have to be strong for them. Honestly, I didn't know how much strength I had left in me. I looked up at the stars and smiled. Soon, baby, soon.